our dealings with, with third countries. Okay, thank you. Let's open it to the floor. Um, so we'll take two at a time, two from this side, two from that side to begin with. Um, you might just say who you are, to whom the question is directed, and please, please keep it brief so we can get as many in as possible. Gentlemen here. My name is Michael Ewing. I'm the coordinator of the environment, Environmental Pillar. We are a, a, an advocacy coalition of 28 national environmental organizations, and we have very strong reservations about TTIP for a variety of reasons. But what I'd like to ask you now is, in relation to the, the negotiations that are ongoing, Ireland and all the other states of the European Union and the United States will be signing up to the Sustainable Development Goals at the end of this month. Have you proofed the, the TTIP for these Sustainable Development Goals? Because I would suggest to you that you haven't, that I think there's a number of things in the goals which would be conflict with the TTIP and its aims. I'd also like to suggest to you that the, the legally binding um, requirement under European law for uh, the precautionary principle is not actually incorporated into the, this engagement either. Thank you. Thank you. And Sean. Uh, Sean Healy from Social Justice Ireland. Um, just to voice a concern, first of all, to preface my remarks by saying I'm positive on trade, I'm positive, I have no problem with change, and I have no problem with disruption where it's necessary either, so it's not to do with that. But I do have a concern, uh, and I draw the uh, people's um, attention to a comment that was made in the presence of a lot of people who are in this room today who were also present at the event in Dublin Castle that uh, reviewed Ireland's a bailout agreement when it had been done. And Michael Noonan, speaking late in that, at, at the end of that uh, event, uh, stated that there was one lesson to be learned from Ireland's bailout agreement, uh, which had been, it was a mistake that had been made and it was repeated in other bailout agreements and uh, it had quite negative consequences and that was the failure to deal with the social implications of the decisions that were actually made. He was pointing to the fact that there was a lot of political implications for consequences subsequently. And I think my concern goes to the same issue here in TTIP. TTIP has implications for taxation. And the implications are, it seems to me, to have it at least. And therefore there are implications for social policy in areas like uh, services, education, health, social welfare, in areas like infrastructure, public transport, social, social housing, broadband, uh, and how these are to be financed and delivered. So it seems to me that in some way or other, there needs to be a spelling out of the social implications and a working through of how they, those are to be addressed. And Michael Ewing's proposal about the sustainable development goals being used as a kind of a, 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 a template against which to, to, to sort of adjust them or whatever, or to test them um, and to, to sort of prove them, might actually be a very good uh, way of dealing with my concern. Good. Okay, thank you. I think the, certainly the first question was definitely directed at David. Okay. Do you want to take that one? Um, well, uh, to deal with the second part of your question, the, the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle is how we operate our regulatory system. I've already said we are not going to change our regulatory system. The Americans are not going to change theirs. We are simply looking at whether there are ways in which we can make these more interoperable and more compatible. In some cases, that will be the case. Uh, in some cases, it will not. Take, for example, uh, the question of uh, hormone-free beef. Uh, we have made it very clear this is not negotiable. Uh, we will not change our policy in this. The Americans have had to accept that. They don't like it, but they've accepted it. Uh, we have made it clear that we're not going to change our system for the approval of GMOs. Uh, that will remain the system we have, which, again, the Americans would prefer that we had a slightly as they would see it, more science-based system, even if I don't fully agree with them. So these differences will remain. Uh, TTIP is not some kind of homog homogenizing steamroller that is going to eliminate distinctions on both sides of, of the Atlantic that remain politically valid. What we are looking for, and where the high level, the work of the high-level uh, group uh, which preceded the opening of negotiations was able to identify nine sectors where it was perfectly possible to imagine interoperability or mutual recognition of uh, certain standards which would reduce the cost of doing business without in any way putting into question uh, our respective commitment to, to high standards. So th these, are, these are the fundamentals. On the question of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 
look, there's been a long-standing debate about the relationship between trade deals and labor standards, environment standards, and all other uh, areas. Uh, I've said there will be a, 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 a sustainable development chapter in this agreement which will deal with the issue of labor and environment, and I have no doubt since the sustainable development goals will be uh, agreed next week uh, or in, in, in the next two weeks, uh, they will be a point of reference uh, for that chapter, which we haven't even yet begun to negotiate. We haven't even come to it yet. So I think it's perfectly possible to take that on board. If I may, to Sean, uh, I'm not aware of any tax implications from TTIP, uh, frankly. Uh, it will not deal with taxation, uh, and I, I don't see in any way how it could have implications for our choices about the kind of tax we have, uh, about the choices we make between what is provided by the state, what is provided through taxation, what is provided through private funding. Uh, these are sovereign choices. Uh, the Irish have one system, the model is different in Denmark than it is in the UK or than it is in Italy uh, or, or completely different again in the United States, but these are all perfectly compatible with free trade agreements which do not impinge uh, on the ultimate sovereignty of states to, to take those kind of decisions. I might just very briefly add to that and just say that, you know, if we if we get the positive outcomes of these negotiations that I believe are possible for companies, you have more jobs, you have more taxes being paid within each individual country, and you have the opportunity for more companies to return taxes. So this could have positive social implications for society. Okay, we take two more. Suzanne here in the front row, and gentlemen in the third row here. Um, Susan Hayes, call it in the Positive Economist. Um, my question is actually more so to Tom because I was interested by the economics of TTIP from the perspective that the net effect could actually be negative from the part of jobs. Um, I, I was interested by your comment to slow it down because it certainly sounds like, as David said at the very beginning, it's not exactly anywhere close to finished yet. And I'm just wondering about the opportunity cost actually of this move. Because I just in your last comment there, you said about abandoning it completely. I mean, I'm listening to Gina's point on the fact that large companies have the bandwidth, the personnel, um, and the deep pockets to, to deal with regulations. But the point of the matter is, is that if we are looking at this SME owner who's flying over to New York today and is dealing with the business visa issue and dealing with so many more, slowing it down could have dramatically negative effects on them today. And it, it, there's so many of, of what I've heard today doesn't matter to the bottom line of them. So I'm just wondering about if we're looking at the potential effect of this going ahead, that's one thing. But if it doesn't go ahead, has the economics been examined on that? And gentleman here. My questions relate to beef issue. Um, I'm glad to hear what you had to say, but nevertheless, there's still a, a widespread feeling out there. And of course, agriculture is the big crunch issue for Ireland in these talks. You know, are the Americans going to really fully give way on hormone induced beef, which of course is outlawed here in the European Union, as you know? I have a feeling no, and that, that, that crunch issue will remain with us. And the other issue is, as the as, the, as the, um, the negotiations proceed, you know, there are great disparities in the, econo in the economies of the various member states. And while the terms of trade at the end of the day may be quite favorable to us and to the, high, the, the very developed economies in the European Union, they may not be so good for Romania and Bulgaria and Greece and maybe the Baltic countries, and that could lead to some difficulty. And then there's Britain, you know, very skeptical and very proud of its fact that it has wonderful clout throughout the world and it's, it can negotiate its own trade deals. And I'm just wondering how enthusiastic they are. And finally, how will all of this fit into the North American free trade area, you know, that would involve Canada and Mexico as well? Because they are, as you know, that's, that exists on the, in, on the, in the other three major countries in North America. I'm John Connor, by the way. I'm a member of the, of the Institute. Yeah, just uh, thanks, Susan, for that question. I, th I think it's important to distinguish between the role of investment and trade in generating growth in the long run and agreements such as this, because the bigger picture here is that in spite of everything, uh, world trade is, is now growing at a very rapid rate again. And typically during the years of rapid economic growth in the world economy, trade was growing at three times the, the average growth in GDP. There are signs right now that uh, it could slow down. There are a lot of warning signs outside Europe, but e even within Europe. So I think the bigger picture really is that um, it's still very important for us, especially as a small open economy. I fail to see how that 
uh, I fail to see that TTIP is actually an essential, urgent item on the agenda for Europe, because I think the crisis in Europe primarily is one of investment, uh, particularly public investment, which is at crisis level now in Ireland and in Germany, just to pick two, two countries with these crazy fiscal rules that make no sense uh, to, to me as an economist at, at any rate. Uh, politically crafted fiscal rules that are constraining essential investment in public infrastructure, renewable energy and other areas, and the failure to date of the Juncker investment plan to really deliver any significant additional investment that wouldn't have already occurred. So I think these are the bigger issues, uh, enterprise development, investment. Trade is important and trade is growing, uh, and I think that therefore we have to subordinate this agenda to social, environmental, and citizen concerns. And that's really the difficulty here, that there's been a disconnect politically with civil society organizations. Uh, there's, there have been some welcome opening up in the last 12 months, but it has been under duress as a result of a very vigorous uh, campaign in, in countries like Britain and Germany. From an Irish point of view, um, we already have a very good uh, situation in relation to foreign direct investment and trade. We're probably one of the most open economies in, in the EU, uh, if you leave aside the, the Luxembourg complication. So again, from our point of view, um, there are opportunities, as mentioned already, in the dairy sector, for example. There are risks in the beef sector. But overall, the Copenhagen study was quite modest in terms of its assessment of the impact on GDP and uh, employment. Uh, I'm, I might just say David started his remarks by describing himself as a spoiled economist. I could describe myself as a spoiled psychologist who's worked all her career in business and, econo and the economy. Um, but uh, my perspective coming back exactly to Susan's point is that for the small and medium-sized businesses, this is a real opportunity to change behaviours, to say here is a massive market of 300 and 20 million people uh, across an enormous geographic territory that you can work in as seamlessly as you can work within the European Union. And I think that is an enormous opportunity and, and that is a, a, you know, an open door that companies need to have. I think this agreement is really important to our future um, and I think it's very important that we know what the opportunity cost of not doing that is as we go forward. Um, just to touch on the agriculture point, uh, firstly, um, on the question of uh, hormone uh, free beef, uh, as you know, we have actually lost a WTO case in this. In this. So the, the issue is actually before the WTO. Uh, a few years ago, I negotiated the deal with the Americans that stopped them from imposing sanctions in return for opening a quota for, non, uh, uh, for hormone free beef. Uh, and that is currently how we've solved the problem. And we have made it very clear to the Americans, they understand fully that in TTIP, we will not change that policy. And that is understood. I, I say accepted, not to give the impression with enthusiasm, but they've accepted it, that it's, it's a political reality. They will, we're, so all the discussions in TTIP about possible beef quotas are on the basis of hormone-free. Um, on the question of um, the attitude of member states, the United Kingdom is extremely enthusiastic. Uh, Mr. Cameron has repeatedly said uh, at all stages that he's extremely enthusiastic. Uh, paradoxically, uh, some of the most greatest enthusiasts are actually Greece, Italy, and Spain, and Portugal, extremely strongly supportive. The, Baltics, the Baltic states also extremely supportive. The biggest opposition at the level of public opinion at the present time is to be found in Germany and Austria. Somewhat paradoxical for those of us who are used to Germany normally driving the free trade agenda in the European Union, but there you are, that's, that's life, that's politics. At governmental level, they are, they, are, they are very supportive. In terms of NAFTA, look, all of this is perfectly mutually compatible. We're talking about free trade agreements. NAFTA is not a customs union. If NAFTA were a customs union, then we would have to negotiate with NAFTA as a whole. But they are still, it's only a free trade agreement. We have just concluded with Canada one of the most ambitious free trade agreements ever concluded between the developed world. 
and we are in the process of transforming a first generation agreement with Mexico, which was concluded about 15 years ago, into an equally ambitious uh, 21st century trade agreement because Mexico are very keen to have that agreement with us. So it is perfectly possible for us to have ambitious trade agreements with Canada, with the United States, with Mexico, and for them to have a North American uh, free trade uh, zone uh, there. And all of this will add to the benefits uh, on, on both sides of the Atlantic. Could I just abuse the position, David? Would you just say a little more about why uh, Germany has taken the position it has, at least German public opinion? Uh, are the Germans becoming less pro-free trade? Um, look, there I need to go to Gina's former profession of psychologist. Uh, I mean, the German establishment is very much in favor. Pu public opinion is against. Uh, started with concerns about chlorine chicken. When that was proven to be a, a non-issue, uh, then the ISDS issue has come up and is still running uh, as a big issue. Um, a certain amount of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the United States because of the Snowden uh, um, uh, stuff with the NSA and so forth. So there's, there's a sort of mix uh, uh, of, of, of reasons I wouldn't attempt to, to attribute it to any one thing, but it's clear when you look at the Eurobarometer polls, whereas globally uh, support for TTIP runs at around 58, 59, 60 percent across Europe as a whole, in most countries much higher, in Germany it's 50-50 or indeed slightly negative. Uh, and Germany, of course, being one of the largest uh, member states, this is not without an impact on the overall, the overall numbers. But in most other countries except Austria and I think Luxembourg, uh, the numbers are actually substantially positive in terms of public opinion. Uh, one there and one at the back. Uh, Noel Dorr, a member of the Institute. Uh, first, thanks to all three speakers and to the Institute for promoting, I think, a much needed debate. Uh, two points briefly to David, if I may. Uh, one is the ISDS. He spoke about renovating it and about what clever lawyers have done. Uh, many people feel that it was started for good reasons in the 1950s to promote investment in developing countries with weak legal systems, but that it's gone out of hand. Uh, it's good news that he said that in the agreement with Canada, it's been reined in a bit and will possibly be in the agreement now, the TTIP. But a question, is there any possibility that that can be extended more widely? And in particular, I think what many people find hard to accept is that the three-member arbitration panel set up, uh, there is no right of appeal from that. And uh, multinationals with deep pockets have what I think lawyers call an inequality of arms in dealing with developing countries. And the mere threat of going to the panel is sometimes enough to halt what the developing country might want to do. That's one question. The other is simply to ask him uh, to confirm, which I think he said already, that the TTIP eventually will need the unanimous agreement of all 28 member states and ratification unanimously by all, three, all 28 member states, because some opponents uh, talk about mixed agreements and allege that these things could be put through by majority vote. But I think he was clear on that point. I just wanted to confirm that I got it right. Um, Philip O'Neill, Irish Farmers Journal. Uh, two questions, um, primarily for the ambassador. Uh, firstly, and I know you can't be in any way precise about this, but all things going well and with a fair wind, how soon do you think a TTIP uh, treaty could be concluded between Europe and the United States? And the second point is, in returning to beef again, which I know may be a bit boring, but it is of huge importance to uh, tens of thousands of Irish farmers. Um, is it conceivable or is it possible indeed that beef would be left outside of a TTIP, an end TTIP uh, treaty between Europe and the United States? Both, both for you, I think. Uh, well, I, I would not like to predict when TTIP will be done because it, you know, as a trade negotiator, form, uh, former recovering trade negotiator, so I'm a spoilt economist and a recovering trade negotiator, um, I never like to lock myself into deadlines. Uh, the earliest it could be done, in my view, is somewhere uh, in the course of next year, uh, as you say, with a fair wind uh, and all, all things being equal. And that is certainly what we are working. We would like to conclude this uh, with the current US administration, if at all possible. But there is a lot of work to be done. 
uh, and um, so it is, it is not guaranteed that that outcome is possible. If that is not possible, I remain convinced that it will be concluded reasonably quickly uh, with the next administration, uh, uh, end of 2017, or pro probably we'll lose the first six or nine months of the new administration given the way things work in Washington, but uh, then the next window of opportunity, in my view, would be sort of back end of 2017. But we are working uh, with the objective of trying to at least conclude the negotiations. Just to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, and maybe I go to Noel Dorr's point on that, uh, the, when we conclude a negotiation, we then need one year to get approval to sign it because we have to translate it into 24 languages, of which also Irish, uh, and then we need to get an agreement in the Council and a vote in the European Parliament to sign the agreement. It then needs to be ratified uh, by uh, the European Parliament and by uh, all of our member states if it is a mixed agreement. Um, no, the, the, the sophistry of my answer is I can't tell you whether we need it, it will be a mixed agreement until we see the agreement. In all likelihood it will be. And if it is a mixed agreement, then it will indeed need to be ratified by all 28 member states uh, uh, as well as by uh, the Council and, and the, European, the European Parliament. Uh, on the issue of uh, the beef, uh, I don't think you can leave beef out. This is a major interest for the United States. Uh, I mean, you know, we all love to do trade deals where I come and say, well, this is what I need from you, and by the way, what you need from me, well, I'm very sorry, that's for another day. It doesn't work that way. What is clear is that we are not going to go for complete liberalization of the beef market. This will be in the form of a tariff rate quota, so there will be a specified amount of beef which will enter duty-free, and anything above that will enter uh, with a tariff. Uh, and that is understood by the American side. Again, I'm not saying understood with enthusiasm, but it is understood with realism. Uh, the issue will be the precise amount, uh, but we've already had some of those discussions in the context of the WTO in Geneva, so I think the farming community has some idea of the orders of magnitude uh, which are uh, uh, under, under discussion. Um, on the uh, ISDS point, no, uh, indeed, uh, the creation of a, a, an appeals court is part of Cecilia Malmstrom's latest proposals. It's not in the Canada agreement yet, but actually the Canadians are rather sympathetic. And I don't exclude that we may make some small adjustment to the Canada Agreement uh, to take on board the uh, new ISDS procedure uh, which Cecilia Maelstrom will propose as a legal text based on her uh, discussion paper which was put forward uh, a, a, a few weeks ago. And I, I really think if you read that, uh, you will see that she has gone a huge way to address the concerns of civil society, of the trade unions, and of other people to really contain and limit the scope of ISDS, to make the procedures much more transparent, to give civil society uh, uh, the right to participate and to be a, a stakeholder in the process, to professionalize the, the, the role of arbitrators, and to foresee a, a, a right of appeal, including, but that, as you can imagine, will be hugely controversial, complicated, as you know from your, your, your previous diplomatic career, the creation of some kind of international tribunal. But of course, creating international legal tribunals is a, uh, a work of uh, uh, the long term and not something that can be done quickly, but that is part of, part of Cecilia Maelstrom's thinking. Okay, thank you. There's more than 10 people down already. Uh, just got to manage expectations here. We're not going to get everyone in, uh, given that we've only got about seven or eight minutes to go, uh, but we'll try and get as many in, uh, lady there and over here. Um, hello, uh, Alice Mary Higgins from the National Women's Council of Ireland and uh, our members have recently also voted to express their, their concern around TTIP, um, particularly in the areas of, of public services and the protection of public services and also public procurement and regulation. Um, I think we're, they're interested in it because it touches on all areas of life, including the art and sport, which were referenced as analogies. They, of course, come into the remit and we've seen previously the exception cultural used to protect them as an area. I'm particularly interested in how, when we talk about exceptions and exclusion and the rights of states to protect public delivery of public services, what are the current exclusions that are in the mix in the negotiations? Or at which other point may exclusions be, be added, be identified? Um, for example, in the transposition of the new European directives on public procurement uh, in 2016, uh, which all countries will be putting their own interpretation into what areas they would like to exclude, exclude from that public procurement. Will those areas be considered to be excluded from TTIP? 
Uh, similarly, in terms of social clauses or social criteria that might be attached to public procurement, will those social clauses and that social criteria stand also in relation to the TTIP negotiations? Okay, can I just pull you and up just, there? Sorry, okay. Just, just, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No problem. Next one. Uh, Frank <coughs> Barry, uh, Professor of International Business at Trinity College. I want to raise an issue here that hasn't been raised, and um, that is, you have to pardon my parochialism, it's a specific concern really only to Ireland. Most of the, most of the foreign direct investment that we attract into, here into Ireland is directed towards the EMEA market, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, of over, the, over recent turmoil and with exchange rate developments and so on, a lot of the American multinationals have switched away from the European market, which has been in the doldrums, towards using their facilities to export to the US. But that's arguably a short-term development. In the long term, it may well be that the removal of trade barriers between the US and Europe gives rise to less foreign direct investment into Europe because the European market can be serviced by US exports. And there is a... Uh, we know actually from what the Bu US Bureau of Economic Analysis said in the late 80s, early 90s, that a lot of the increase in foreign direct investment into Europe at the time was because of fears of Fortress Europe. So that would support my position. I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm not convinced of you know, the, 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 the validity of this argument, but I think it's an important issue to address. Good. Gina, Tom, do you want to pick up on that point before we go to David for the yes, other point? Yes, if I could. I mean, I think the FDI story into Europe is much bigger than just access to the European market. The FDI story into Ireland is much, much bigger than that. Um, it's about talent. It's about access to markets, yes, more widely, but access to uh, talent and capacity. So um, I, I, I think it's, those decisions are made on very, very broad commercial terms, um, and I don't think that this agreement is going to actually change that. I think it will be business as usual, and it may offer the opportunity for further expansion of FDI into Europe. Uh, yeah, uh, somewhere in the Copenhagen study, the risk, uh, th there was a noting of the risk to FDI um, I think it was in the chapter on pharmaceuticals. I'm subject to correction on that. So it wasn't uh, particularly a major point, but it was noted. So there are, again, uncertainties here about how this might pan out in the long run. Um, I mean, of course, but if I may say so, don't forget the huge European investment in the United States. We are the largest foreign investor by far in the United States. When I travel around America, nearly every state I go to, the European Union uh, and its companies are the biggest investors in the United States. And the reason why people make these investment choices is mainly uh, proximity to market. And all the business people I talk to tell me that actually goods trade across the Atlantic is likely to be to something which will diminish. Services trade will increase and investment will increase because that's the way business see themselves going. So I, I, I agree, it's, it's not a negligible risk because it would be stupid to say it's not, but if you look at the trend and the way it's going, I think it's all going in the opposite direction. Uh, on the issue of public services, look, it's very simple. We have these exclusions in all our existing trade agreements. All our trade agreements in the services chapter, we have a clear exclusion for everything to do with public provision uh, of public services uh, and for the issue of social clauses in public procurement. It's all already dealt with. And all we have said publicly is we will do the same thing in TTIP. This is not new. This is not a new problem. We've debated this on many separate occasions. We debated it in the context of the Doha development agenda. It's in all our bilateral agreements. So we're not inventing anything new here. Uh, what all we're saying is that the Americans have exactly the same concern as us. And Mike Froman was just as happy to sign that joint declaration with uh, uh, Cecilia Malmstrom saying TTIP will not affect uh, the sovereign right of uh, governments and in the case of the United States of individual states uh, to uh, uh, choose how they provide public services and what uh, social clauses they attach to public procurement. The only issue we're looking for is equal access uh, in terms of non-discrimination, in terms of ability to bid. But when you bid, you will bid on the same terms as the national countries in respect of the, the, the national provisions, or in our case, uh, the EU provisions uh, transposed by, by our member states. So sincerely, 
I really don't see why this, 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 this should be a problem. It has not been a problem in any previous trade agreement. I don't see why it would suddenly turn into a problem in this trade agreement. I'm very sorry, particularly to the two people with the microphones, but we have just come up to time and we just don't have time for a, a, another round. Uh, I won't take up your time by, by summing up, only to say that I think we've covered a huge amount of ground here and I think it's been very informative. Uh, I'd like to thank the Commission, which I may have neglected to mention at the beginning. If I did, uh, I'm sure Barbara and Onal will uh, forgive me. Thanks to the National Gallery. Thank to, thanks to you all for coming. And most of all, thanks to our speakers for such an informative event.